Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gutter of the prison of the grave. There's no other end, but they never learn. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in... The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Collector's Item. They turn the corner, cabby. Don't lose them. Don't worry, mister. Uh, there they are up ahead of that new nest. Uh-huh. And a white Panama hat shows up through the back window of that cab like a signboard. Besides, I've been doing okay so far, ain't I? We stayed in this tail for 20 minutes now. Yeah, but I've been tagging the guy under that hat for six hours. Six hours? For a movie, a Turkish bath, three bars, a restaurant, and two museums. Close the gap a little, huh? Whatever you say, mister. But the libel will spot us. Uh, how much longer are you going to keep this up? What difference does it make as long as your flag's down? Big difference. My old lady be awful sore if I don't get home tonight. And this father leader routine looks like an endurance contest. Take it easy, cabby. At 10 o'clock tonight, a certain big deal will be closed, and then we can both forget about that guy up there and go home. Big deal? What kind of big deal? Uh, I ain't nosy. I just don't want no trouble. You'll get no trouble. It's approximately legal, ain't it? Legal is Confederate money. Confet? Nah, just a minute. I got a living thing. I'm serious. So am I. Sirius is a rare coin dealer. Oh, a numismatist. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, what do you know? <laughs> I collect Indian hat pennies myself. Small world. Uh, and a guy up there in a the hat's trying to loss up a sale, huh? That it? Uh, roughly, yeah. Uh, keeping an eye on him till the deal goes through at ten. He's a screwball from the deep suit. Hey, the light's changing. He's going to be caught. Hey, uh, you want I should slow down? No, no, no. Pull up behind him. It's okay. Right. Hey, mister, look, did you see that? Yeah. Panama hat, it's gone. Yeah, when I drive, I hit his brakes, it disappeared. Pull up beside him, quick. Can you see? Yeah, the seat's empty. Ooh, what a oh. pair of chumps. They've been chasing nothing but a hat propped up in the back of that seat. No kidding. Gee, it sure looked natural, didn't it, mister? Ah, uh, nuts, let me out. Now, look, you get to that other driver. Find out where he dropped his passenger off and anything else you can. Yeah. Here. Here's 30 bucks for your trouble. Wow, for that kind of dough, my wife can go ahead and get some. Hey, call me at the office, mister. Just ask for Joe Joplin. Ah, keep your shirt on, you get there. Come on, Rayardi, be there, be there. You'll go off like a Roman candle. Come on, be there. Hello. Huh. Hello, Leon Riotti speaking here. Marlo Riotti, I got bad news for you. Huh? A boy, Seth Appleborough, pulled a backwoods gag on me and I fell for it, flat on my face. He shook me. I don't know how long it happened, but... Uh... But I do. Ah, I know exactly how long ago. Appleborough was here. He was? He was in my shop. He's a madman, that, that madman. Swoy would kill me, but he didn't. What happened? He was after the coin, of course. He got tough, but I, <laughs> I got more tough. I'm not born the day before yesterday. I was forced to ruin a beautiful Renaissance vase on his stupid skull, but at least I got rid of him. So I say fooey on Seth Appleborough. Oh. I beat him up myself, myself, you hear? <laughs> and I throw him out. It's finished. <laughs> so at 10, I shall sell the coin to Pierre Bowman as a range, and that will be that. Well, glad to hear it, Ray Artie. Just send the check uh, to... Just uh... a minute, Mr. Marlowe. Huh? Who's there? Who's back there? Who is it? Rayotti. Hey, Rayotti, what's the matter? No! No, wait, wait! No, listen, dog! Shut! Rayotti! Marlo, you. Rayotti! 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 I ran out of the phone booth, hailed the first cab that came along, and headed for 113 Marion Avenue. Leon Riotti's shop was a narrow cell with tattered green shades drawn over dingy windows. The front door was locked, so I went around to the alley where I'd left my car earlier. The back door to Riotti's was half open. 
Quietly, Artie sat on the floor, his legs straddled out, his head slumped against the bottom drawer of his desk like, like a drunk too tired to look for the way home. Beside him on the floor was all that was left of the reason for it. A small open box lined with blue velvet and labeled Unique, Confederate States of America, half dollar. One of four struck at New Orleans Mint, 1861. Only piece of this series now in existence. Sauce, Colonel J.J. Appleboro Collection, 1880. But the box was empty. The four bits worth of Confederate money was gone. I picked the phone up in my handkerchief and called the cab company office. A few minutes later, I had Joe Joplin. Yeah, I got that other drive okay, mister, but I couldn't pry much out of him. Even the hard way, I tried. He left that southern drawl off at the Wiltshire Gardens, Villa 9. And he got orders to take the Panama hat on a $10 drive around town. That's all? That's all he knows. He thought it was some kind of joke. Wiltshire Gardens, number nine. Okay, Joe, yeah. thanks. I called Homicide, told Lieutenant Matthews where he could pick up the body, and before he could order me to stick around, promised to fill in the details later and hung up. After that, I got in my own car and drove to the Wilshire Gardens Hotel, Villa 9. What finally came to the door, and he did open a cautious two inches, had a mop of renegade hair the color and shape of tumbleweed, a body as gaunt as a piece of barbed wire and two sick gray eyes that tried hard to hide under a pair of scrub brush eyebrows. Seth Appleboro wasn't glad to see me. State your business, sir. What's more, I'm a busy man. I'm not well, so be brief. Okay, we'll start off with murder. Murder? Now, see here, we'll sir. follow that with a missing Confederate half a buck. Now, do I come in peaceful like or do I knock the door down? Don't go riling me up, Yankee. Well, you won't get in at all. What's your name? Philip Marlowe. My business at the moment is trying to square things with a client I let down very badly. Client? Then you must be referring to that low-down, unscrupulous carpetbagger, Leon Rodi. <laughs> You're a little confused, aren't you? Rayotti's from Italy. From northern Italy, sir. And a crooked, unprincipled carpetbagger. You said that. The kind who strips the south of her treasures, who pillages and loots and... What? A gun? Well, what's the meaning of that firearm in your hand, sir? I haven't got time for another civil war. Okay. Now, get away from that door. I'm coming in. You carpetbagger. Now, let's knock off the nonsense, Appleboro. Where's the half a buck? Where, indeed. My poor old fool of a grandpappy, the colonel, sold it. Sold it for practically face value, sir just to keep body and soul together on the plantation back in 1880. And what he was given for it wasn't worth dirt compared to what that fine old piece of Confederate money's really worth. All right, all right. Where is it? Come on, hand it over. Well, I don't have it, sir. Oh. Not yet. But by ginger, I'm going to get it. And when I do, it's going home where it belongs, you hear? To the south. Oh. You better oh, go to head. the couch and take another pull on your mint julep, Buster. You look bad. My head. And then I want that coin. I'm not kidding. <laughs> that... That Riyadh, they crowned me with an iron pot. Oh, but that won't stop me, sir. I'm not going to stand by and let that rare old half dollar be desecrated any farther. I'll prevent it being sold to any rich, dawdling oath of a collector who has the audacity to live in Sherman Oaks, if it's the last thing I do. And you, you, sir, you won't stop me either. Sit down, I told you. Oh, a crackpot. Oh, my head. I should have known. Win, lose, or draw, I'm turning you over to the police right now, Appleboro. Charges murder and larceny, and it's too bad, but you're a cinch to beat both raps on a goofball plea. You, huh? big boy, put down the phone, drop your gun. Oh, rebel reinforcements. Drop it, I said. Oh, friend, indeed. Providence is still smiling, sir. Yeah, sure. She's hilarious, Mr. Appleboro. Right, big boy? Well, don't you see the humor of the situation? Oh! stranger had a flat saucer face, a sour grin in the left hand like a, <clears throat> like a trip hammer. I'd done my best to roll with a punch, but I'd still caught enough of it to jar my brains loose. When I finally got up again, Villa 9 was empty. It took a while for that to soak in, along with another fact. I was up against a team, Appleboro and Saucer Face. Also, it was now 9.30, which gave me just half an hour to get the Sherman Oaks for what had to be the next scheduled meeting. The Boneman Mansion on Clooney Drive, from giant iron gate out front through overgrown grounds and up to the entrance, 
Looks a lot more like the prop room at the Metropolitan Opera than anybody's residence. When I lifted the brass ring in the brass lion's mouth and let it fall, I got another surprise. She had deep hazel eyes with long lashes, close-cropped copper-colored hair, and packed full green suede dress that put no strain on the imagination. A bare shoulder is made to think of toasted marshmallows. Hello. Uh, hello. <coughs> you, uh, you wouldn't be Pierpont Bowman, huh? And you must have had some reason for knocking, other than window shopping. Yeah, yeah. My name's Marlowe. I used to work for Leon Rayardi before he was murdered tonight. Murdered? Mm-hmm. Is this supposed to concern my Uncle Pierpont? Yeah, I think it does. From the fuss that's being kicked up, about four bits worth of Confederate money, you'd think that it was a chest of Easterling sterling silver. <laughs> Only four bits, huh? Uh-huh. Yes. Yes, I'm afraid he is vitally interested. Come in, Marlowe. Wait here. All right. Uncle Pierpont, come here. Huh? What? What? Well, what's the matter, Christine? There's a man here to see you, and Mr. Marlowe. You'd better talk to him. Oh? What do you want? Huh? Oh, oh you. Oh, what is it, Marlowe? Well, it's about the half a dollar, the one you intend to buy from Leon Rayardi, Mr. Bowman. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, well, what about it, man? Rayardi was murdered tonight. Hmm? Uh, that murdered, you say? Mm-hmm. Well, uh, if that's true, he hasn't had time to hit the ground yet. What's your game, Sonny? You must have some kind of a game. What is it? No games. I'm telling you, Rayardi was shot and the coin stolen. Are you sure about that? Are you positive? No mistake? Are you certain, Marlowe? I couldn't be more certain if it was tattooed on my forehead. I heard it happen and saw his body over an hour ago. What do you think of that, Uncle Pierpont? Marlowe looks at dead bodies, too. I think it's Bobbycock. Yep. What do you think, Chris? Uh, wait a minute. Let me tell you what I think. Huh? It's more to the point. I came here because I'm also certain that the man who killed Rayardi is the man who took the coin. And that he'll show up here in the next few minutes posing as Rayardi and try to sell you that half a buck as planned. I want you two to help me get him. You know, Marlowe, I think you're bombing. Now look, baby, I've what? had quite enough... An... Hold on, hold on now. There's just one teensy thing wrong with your little scheme, Marlowe. You see, ten minutes ago, Leon Rayardi, or someone who said he was Leon Rayardi, was here. I gave him $37,000 cash as agreed, and he gave me this. The only one of its kind in the world. The 1861 Confederate half dollar. In just a moment, we will return to the second act of Philip Marlowe, but first... There are songs for sale, and one of them may turn into the nation's newest hit as you listen in to CBS on Friday nights. This hour-long program of melody is called Songs for Sale, and during the hour, you hear four songwriters with unpublished music as they present their tunes to a panel of veteran, top-flight songwriters. At the end, the panel picks out one song to be published and plugged, and you'll hear the reasons they give for their choice. Be listening to Songs for Sale tonight on most of these same CBS stations. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, the second act of Philip Marlowe, and tonight's story, The Collector's Item. When the wobbly screwball collector clinked the $37,000 50-cent piece on the tabletop in front of me, his eyes flashed on like a pair of unfrosted light bulbs. And something close to frost started to collect in the upturned corners of his mouth that smiled like the cat that had just eaten the canary, cage, bird seed, and all. There was little doubt about it. Septuagenarian Pierpont Bowman was what an eccentric would call eccentric. And he was very unconcerned with the murder of Leon Rayardi, and very fuzzy about what Rayardi's impersonator had looked and sounded like. I'm afraid I can help little on that score, Mr. Marlowe. Only had eyes for the coin. And what a coin she is. Why, sir, Mr. You Bowman, know... you've got to remember something. Height, build, color of eyes, hair, voice. Eh... Yeah, 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 voice. Was it a southern accent? Think, Mr. Bowman. Hmm? Southern accent? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, oh. no, no, Mr. Marlowe can say if it was or not. My hearing isn't all it used to be, you know. But Christine here, now maybe she can... No, 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 no. Christine wasn't in the room. Answered the door myself. But I did see him come up the walk, Mr. Marlowe, from my room upstairs. He was tall, about your height. Oh, no, perhaps a mite shorter. And he wore a gray suit. 
No, no, no. Darker than gray. Sort of light blue shade. Oh, that's great. Like a... Yeah, thanks a lot. And before I start reaching for a butterfly net myself, I think I better get back to Seth Appleborough's place on Wilshire. Why there? Surely if he's the guilty one, Mr. Marlowe, he won't wait to be apprehended. Not on purpose, no. But when I last ran into him and his buddy-buddy with a saucer face, he was fighting an acute case of vertigo. Might have collapsed since. And besides, I don't know where else to go. Oh, but, sir, why must you go any place? The police will attend to that Mr. Mr. Appleborough. Now, look, Mr. Marlowe, here on the rim of Mr. the Mr. Boneman, coinos, this may yeah. mean nothing in the numismatic league. Yeah. But I went to work for Leon Riotti to protect him, a job I didn't do. Also, losing clients this way is bad for my business and conscience. Good night, and happy gathering coins in May. Mr. Marlowe, wait, please. Please, Mr. Marlowe, let me see you out and explain something. Be just a minute, Uncle. Well, what is it? I'll pay you $500, Mr. Marlowe, not Confederate dollars either, to see that Uncle gets his money back and that the coin is returned to that Mr. Rayardi's estate. What? You're against the deal? Why? Because it's the hundredth one in the past two years. You hate to see the money you'll one day inherit go to a bunch of screwballs, huh? Why, you foul-minded, no hey! good... I've got news for you, Mr. Marlowe. It's not my inheritance I'm concerned with, it's my uncle. In spite of this mansion and all the junk in it, that $37,000 was every cent he had left. Okay, kid. In that case, two points. One? I had the slap coming. Two, I'll do my best to back up everything to where I came in. Good night. Good night. And Mr. Marlowe? Yeah. I, I didn't enjoy slapping you. She said it like she meant it. Twenty minutes later, I was back at the Wilshire Gardens where I found Villa 9 as dark and quiet as the bottom of a well. I had just about decided to quit playing long shots labeled I Hope He Passed Out on His Front Doorstep when, from a nearby clump of pepper trees, I caught a glimpse of a shadowed figure moving toward me, one slow step at a time. I knew that I was spotted and strictly sitting duck, so I tried the only possible out. General nonchalance in my back to the pepper trees long enough for the not-so-stealthy hunter to get within hunting distance. And a good good evening to you, Brother Appleborough. Now, sir, get up and start talking. What? Well, saucer face. Thought I had your partner. Hey, you got wrong, Hasty, and you're still doing it. Appleborough's my partner like you look good in tights. The name is Locke, Fred Locke, Treasury Department. Treasury? You mean you're after Appleborough? Uh-huh. I sapped you because from the gab I overheard, I figured you were nothing but a lone wolf shooting with a coin. Oh, Appleboro, friend, is big game. He's wanted on half a dozen counts, a lot more important than this Confederate half a buck. Yeah, but he must have gotten away from you because <laughs> he I... He did, he did. Jumped out of my car a couple of blocks from here. But <clears throat> how do you know about that? Who are you? Oh, well, name's Marlowe. I'm a private detective, license included. Wait a minute. Here. Oh. I know that Appleboro got away because he's already been up to the Boneman place where he posed as my client, Leon Riotti, who... Incidentally, he killed so he could sell the Confederate lucky piece up there for 37,000 bucks. Mm -hmm. Quite a hunk of change. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, sorry we crossed our wires, Marlon. Thanks for the word. Oh. But don't yeah. worry, he won't get far. Us team men will see to that. Uh, keep in touch with the department if you find out anything, will you? Sure. Oh, uh, say, Locke. Yeah? Yeah, uh, what is it? Just a hunch. Oh, like what? Like you're a cockeyed liar! Like treasury men don't call themselves team Any more than private detectives call themselves private eyes! Great. Now, Locke, let's try inside your jacket. Now, right. and get rid of this non-treasury department luger. And two, check the wallet and see if at least Fred Locke is your real name. All right, it's my name, it's my name. Yeah, surprise it is. I'm out of imagination, team man <coughs> Come on, get up and start working on a few Please. other questions like where Seth Appleboro is at the moment. And exactly what that guy in is, it was blasted. Well, do we keep this up all night? No, no, no. I'll tell you. I'll tell you everything. Okay. Now, first the setup. Come on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There were two of us. Me and Adam. No. No! It had come from the street that was just beyond the pepper trees and slammed in a lock front and center, folded him up like it was built on hinges. 
By the time I was out of the impact area and had my 38 in hand, the only target I had was a pair of taillights blinking out of sight in a funnel of dust. Fred Locke was blood smeared, dead, and made an ugly centerpiece for the little ring of startled faces that began to converge. I stepped back and became just another sightseer. When a small, bald man with a large white eyebrow and lots of worries stamped on his face began to do his lamenting out loud. He was the Wilshire Gardens hotel manager and didn't care much for public spectacles on the home grounds. Oh, oh, my goodness. One minute that Mr. Appleborough unconscious in his car, and the next this man is shot to death. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Appleborough's unconscious in his car? Where? At the other end of the grounds. There's a nasty cut in his forehead. Uh, one of the guests just found him there. I was just about to call a doctor. Never mind the doctor. Show me the way. Come on. Dixie boy, breathe deep. Uh, who? Uh, oh, you again? Yeah, sir? me again. And you're up to your drawl in a couple of untidy murders. Now snap out of it. Oh, oh my. It's no use. He doesn't even hear you. That's all right. While it's this peaceful, I think I'll check on this drooping flower of the old south. His wallet should do it. Uh, do what? Prove whether or not he gave me a straight pitch. Uh-huh. Yeah. What do you know? Huh? Membership card, Sons of the Confederacy, New Orleans chapter. Uh, here, let, let me see. Hmm. Uh-huh. Oh, that's his picture, all right. Sure is. Well, when the police get here, they, uh... Hey, look. Yeah, what is it? His wristwatch was smashed against the dashboard. Uh, so it is. Uh, he must have held his hand up to protect his head when he fell forward. Yeah, now look, friend, the name's Marlow. When the law gets here, tell them they can find me at Sherman Oaks, the Pierpont Bowman residence. Oh, now, wait a minute. You can't leave me here with all this on my hands. The police are going to want to know what this is all about. I'll try and have an answer for them. But first, I've got to ask a crazy collector a not-so-crazy question. Mr. Marlowe, I was hoping you'd come back. No flowers and candy, honey. This isn't a social call. Then what brings you here? Your uncle, is he still up? Yes, but he asked not to be disturbed. Why? I got a picture I want him to look at. What kind of a picture? A man. Possibly the man who sold him the coin tonight. Now, where is he? In the gun room. Oh, but he'll scream bloody murder if we bother That's him. That's the subject on hand. You mean you found out who killed Leon Riotti? No, no. I found out someone else has been killed. Come on, huh? Over that coin? Who was it, Marlowe? Guy named Locke. We'll get to the fine print later. Is this the room? Uh, yes, but I'm... It's just the man I want to see. Oh, Mr. Bowman, I hear you. Well, it's quite a blunderbuss. Look, point that somewhere else. Uh, oh, 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 so it is. Uh, but don't let it worry you, Mr. Marlowe. This harkabus hasn't been fired in 300 years. That's great. Let's not spoil its record tonight, shall we? Uh, here, have a look. Fine workmanship. Later on. Right now, Mr. Bowman, I want you to have a look. This picture, it's Seth Appleborough. Huh? Is this the man who sold you the coin, the one you couldn't remember? Uh, no, no, not the party. Now, on this gun, Mr. Marlowe... Uncle, we've had another murder. Huh? Oh, oh my, that's too bad. But what's all that got to do with me? I'm not sure. But, Mr. Bowman, if Appleborough wasn't the one who sold you that hot half a buck, it must have been an item named Locke. Huh? The saucer face buddy-buddy I told you about before. Oh. The one who sapped me at Wiltshire Gardens. Oh, very interesting. Uh-huh. And perhaps tomorrow, Uncle, Mr. Marlowe... Uncle, please. Go on, Mr. Marlowe. Well, there isn't much more. When I left here and I went back for Appleborough, I ran into Locke. We mixed it up and I was just about to get him to talk when he was shot out from under me. What? Appleborough did it? He shot Locke? No. He couldn't have. Oh, why not? Because Appleborough was out cold in his car at the time. <laughs> then all you really know is that Appleborough didn't kill this Locke. Oh, I know a little more. I also know now that there's a third interested party mixed in. Who? You, maybe. Uncle? What? Me? Sure. You could have killed Rayotti via a hired flunky like Locke. Sold yourself the coin. After all, you're broke. It's been done before. (laughs) You're mad. It's insane, Marlowe. The idea. To think that Uncle would hire the likes of Fred Locke. Why, it... Slips, Christine? You shouldn't have known Locke's front name was Fred, should you? I never mentioned it. What? Christine, you mean that... I mean that nobody moves. Christine. Oh, fine. This is one gun in here that's no relic. It's been fired something less than 300 years ago. Yeah, to be exact, less than an hour ago at the Wilshire Gardens when you used it to keep Locke quiet, huh? You, Christine, you're the third party Marlowe is talking about. 
You hired Fred Rock and, and, and Appleborough. Had nothing to do with it, Mr. Bowman. It was your niece's partner, Fred Lock, who killed Ray Artie in his shop and stole the half a buck. After that, he followed me to Appleborough's place in Wiltshire Gardens. There he KO'd me and Appleborough both. Then came out here and sold you the coin. Posing as Riyadh. Uh, Correct. You can both go to the head of the club. Not yet. One question, teacher. Why did Locke go back to Appleborough's? Couldn't have been just luck that I found him there. It wasn't. He was afraid Appleborough had seen him kill Ray Artie at the shop. He had to know for sure. Your turn, Uncle. Why did you do it, Christine? I was sentimental, Uncle. I wanted at least the last of your money as a keepsake. And now that I've got it, I want one thing more before I leave. That half dollar in your pocket. <laughs> Hand it over. Come on. The half dollar, but... It's worthless to you, Christine. You can never sell it again. Every collector in the world will be on the lookout for it. Don't you think I know that? Then what do you want with it? The pleasure of getting rid of it. I hate it. Like I hate every piece of junk you've squandered your fortune on. The fortune I'd have inherited someday. I'm going to throw it in the first deep river I come to. Hand it over. No, you don't, Christine. <laughs> drop it, drop it. <laughs> now, sit in that chair while you can. You may end up in another one. The police arrived. They always do. And after a long hour of questions and answers, there were only two of us left. Pierpont Bowman, standing close to a window, tears crowding his eyes. The fingers of his right hand nervously toying with a Confederate coin. And me, thinking about Leon Rayati and Fred Locke and Christine. It was the old man who finally broke it up. A rotten thing! I left after that. So I don't know if Appleboro got the coin or not. You might check if you're ever running through the New Orleans Museum. Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character, star Gerald Moore, are produced and directed by Richard Sanville and written for radio by Robert Mitchell and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were D.J. Thompson, Anthony Barrett, Shepard Menken, Tom Tully, and Jack Crucian. The special music is composed and conducted by Richard Arant. <laughs> Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... This time an old man dead in a flop house, a sot who carved wood, a fallen lady with an eye for gold lockets and a snake with big ears. All led me to a soft spot in a killer's hard heart. Every Friday night, CBS brings you stories taken from the files of parole boards of the 48 states. With only the names changed, these stories give in detail the events of a criminal's life up to the time he is up for parole. Then, before you hear the board's decision, you can make up your mind. Is this man ready to be set free? It's been hailed by press and public alike as an outstanding anti-crime show. And you can hear it now by staying tuned because Up For Parole follows immediately on most of these same CBS stations. Roy Rowan speaking. This is CBS, where you play Sing It Again every Saturday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System.